Hello there, welcome to another new week in which we've got a fresh batch of stories from the African business landscape. From the Kenyan capital Nairobi, this is Global Business Africa. With plenty of content from all corners of Africa. I'm Raman Yang, here's what we have lined up for you in the next half hour. Ebola does continue to ravage African economies. We'll have the latest details on the carnage. Elsewhere, the Naira is still hitting new record lows. We'll be live in London looking at what happens next. And later on, we'll introduce you to a group of enterprising businessmen who've beaten many odds to make a cheese-making empire in Goma. Well then, let's start in West Africa, Mali and Guinea to be specific. The public transport industry in both countries has been greatly affected by the Ebola outbreak. To put in Mali, has actually come to complete halt. The usually busy route between Mali's capital of Bamako and Conakry of in Guinea is virtually empty. And operators in both places are now mourning the losses. Ebola continues to ravage West Africa, crippling several economies in its wake. Mali's public transport industry is among the latest casualties and together with neighbouring Guinea is almost grinding to a halt. The road between Mali's capital Bamako and Conakry in Guinea, once a bustling business route, is now a ghost of its past. Ebola is killing people but is also killing the businesses. Our buses continue to remain at the bus stage for hours without a single passenger boarding them. Buses are then forced to look for passengers on the roads and in the villages. And the Bamako-Konakry route is at a complete halt. The public transport owners are now running out of options. Well, life is very difficult by this time. The minibuses carrying passengers arrive just one by one. And for us and for the state, it is a big loss. If this situation lasts too long, we'll not be able to pay taxes because we do not earn anything, we'll be obliged to ground the vehicles. Last month, the World Bank predicted the GDP growth in Mali's neighbor Guinea, the epicenter of the recent Ebola outbreak, would fall from 4.5 to 3.5 percent. Ebola continues to spread further in Mali, with reports of more than 300 people quarantined. Mali shares a 1,000-kilometer border with Guinea. The Ebola virus has severely tested the health sectors of affected countries, prompting the closure of many borders as travel becomes more restricted between West African nations. Clementine Logan, CCTV. Let's talk about African currencies now. The Naira is not the only African currency that's getting battered by a combination of a stronger dollar on one hand and lower oil prices on the other. Egypt's pound has also been taking quite the beating with a wide divergence between official and black market rates. And analysts say the pound is likely to weaken even further given the shutting down of some illegal foreign exchanges in the country. Yasser Kim has more. It's been a shock to many as the Egyptian pound plunged in the black market after a year of stability. Analysts owe this drop to two main reasons. There is a high demand for dollars to cover imports which amount to 70% of our total needs. Second, nearly $4 billion of debts are to be paid back to Qatar and Paris Club in the next two months. If dollar continues to rise, then oil prices will increase, putting more burden on Egyptians. The central bank quickly moved to curb the surge in dollars. It closed down tens of foreign exchange offices that didn't adhere to market prices. Central bank says a crackdown on the black market will help stabilize the Egyptian pound. Egyptians who need dollars, however, say this procedure will raise the dollar price further. I can't find dollars. Closing down all these exchange offices at once will lead to more shortages of dollars in the market, while demand is still high. End result is more losses for pound. Analysts expect the government procedures to be effective, but only on the short term. It's like a painkiller. The real solution is to increase investments, increase exports and revive the tourism industry. This will provide billions of dollars that will strengthen the pound and economy for the long haul. It's been a tough week for the economy. 
Analysts say, however, the government is trying hard to overcome these challenges promptly to create the stability needed for investors before the upcoming economic summit. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. Over to South Africa now, power utility ESCOM is remaining on a fairly high alert this week and it's warning that blackouts in the country could continue. Pretty bad news all around down there. ESCOM did start load shedding a little earlier on to ensure that the national grid could essentially remain stable after a silo collapsed at the Majuba Power Station. The situation, however, was made a lot worse when ESCOM emptied the other two silos after a crack was spotted in one of them, that silo is 20 and 30. Now, to compound matters, the Matimba Power Station in the northern end of the country overheated and didn't provide its regular supply to the grid. A further issue with the supply of diesel, so ESCOM declaring a power emergency on Sunday, large industrial users were told to cut their consumption but up to 20%, sorry, 10% in order to ease pressure on the grid. The company said the accumulative effect of issues at various power stations combined with low diesel reserves essentially meant it's not able to meet the country's power demands all the time. While load shedding over the weekend, we, we managed to re recover our, our emergency reserves, which has put us on a very strong footing for the coming week. So we're glad to say no load shedding, and we're hoping to get through the week without further load shedding. So at this stage, we're cautiously optimistic that we've got this particular problem under control. What we found in, on previous occasions was that ESCOM would decide on a particular load shedding cycle, and the municipalities would decide on their own load shedding cycle. They would still be compliant with ESCOM's desires, but on a different basis and all this does is create confusion and often when one goes to websites one finds one message and in experience you find another message call centers are not to be relied relied upon extensively in a crisis because they tend to not be able to cope with the demands on those call centers so this leaves businesses and households um, in many instances at a loss Let's head over to South Africa now. Angela Kupler has been following developments in uh, the country's power crisis in detail. He joins us now live from uh, Johannesburg. Angelo, how much of the 1.7 gigawatts of generation capacity that was taken offline on Sunday is now back on? Well, according to Andrew Etzinger, he said to me late this afternoon that all the power has been recovered. Um, that they lost over the weekend. As he put it, it was a perfect storm. We had the very dry conditions at the Matimba power station up north, and this power station relies on, wait for it now, prevailing, prevailing winds to cool the plant. There were no winds, so it got very hot, and so that plant at Matimba couldn't actually provide or operate at full capacity. And then, of course, down at Majuba, we had all the rains. Remember, they lost that silo, as you mentioned earlier, and the rains have now set in. So it's quite difficult to maintain the flow of electricity. And as Etzinger put it to me, you just need a small hiccup at either one of the power stations and the grid becomes under pressure. But it seems like it's back on track, Roman. Indeed. Uh, Solidarity, however, has uh, accused ESCOM management of essentially glossing over, not fixing the cracks that did appear in silos 20 and 30 at Majuba. I mean, the whole thing smells of a cover-up here. Has ESCO management responded to the accusations from Solidarity? Well, Solidarity's members, who are really the, the skilled portion of the, employ, in, the employers or employees at the different ESCOM plants, have been warning ESCOM for several months now. They said there have been several issues at several of the uh, silos, specifically at the staging area where the coals actually delivered. So that uh, silo was closed, but it now appears that the crack that they found um, last week was reported to ESCOM, and when nothing was done, the members then went to Solidarity and said to them, look, we have an issue here. When I spoke to ESCOM on Friday, they sidestepped the issue and told me that they were aware of the claims that were being made by uh, Solidarity, note the word claims, and they'd already emptied the two silos and they were preparing those silos for an investigation which would follow. No time yet given, but it does appear that there's some point scoring and some dodging of issues going on at the moment. Raman? Indeed. We'll have to leave it there for the time being. Thank you very much for the update. That's Angelo Coppola in South Africa. Back to currencies once again. Nigeria's uh, local currency, the Naira, started off the week in a pretty lousy note. It hit another record low, the latest in a string of them, of 178.25 against the dollar in Monday trading. That was down about half a percentage point compared to its close on Friday. Now, dealers said the weakening of the currency is due to a combination of strong demand for the greenback on one hand and a steep fall in global oil prices 
on the other. The Naira has been hitting new lows all the way throughout November despite regular central bank intervention. Foreign exchange dealers say this continuous fall has compelled the Central Bank of Nigeria to ask about 21 banks to bid for about $2 million each. Now, foreign investors have increased the pace of their outflows from Nigerian assets overall since August. They've been cutting their equity and debt market exposure. Uh, altogether, as the price of Brent crude, that's a benchmark against which Nigerian oil is sold, has fallen. Dealers said the demand for dollars was mainly from importers who are buying consumer goods and electronics well ahead of the Christmas holidays, when consumption, of course, does tend to rise quite a bit. Let's look at the implications now. Heading over to London, Melanie Ralph has been following events there for us. So, Melanie, for how much longer, really, can the CBN continue this defence of the Naira? Well, Rama, that's the golden question. The central bank has already spent billions of dollars of reserves intervening uh, to prop up the currency this year. According to the figures on the central bank's website, it has this year spent on an average of 26.6 million a day defending the Nira. Nigeria's uh, Nira opened at a record low today, which is now down almost 11 percent this year. And the concern is that falling oil prices will lead to lower government revenues, not to mention political tensions we're seeing ahead of elections in February. And there's also the violent insurgency by the Islamist group Boko Haram that has contributed to concerns about stability in Africa's biggest economy and number one crude oil producer. So certainly the central bank has its work cut out to help the currency along. Indeed, the Monetary Policy Committee is meeting today and the meeting, of course, does end tomorrow. What do analysts and investors on your end do expect, uh, what do they expect rather, the MPC to do? Do they expect them to hold rates to the current levels or to raise them? Yeah, well, markets are waiting to see if the central bank will do anything to help the currency, but the expectation is to keep interest rates on hold despite some pressure for an increase to support the currency. The US dollar is resurgent, strengthened by an improving economy, and the Federal Reserve has shut down its massive bond purchase program and it's tipped to raise rates from near zero in the second quarter of next year. And emerging economies such as Ghana, Brazil and Ukraine have raised rates to support their currencies, and most say it's only a matter of time before Nigeria follows suit. Indeed, we'll have to leave it there for the time being. Uh, Melanie Ralph there live in London. She'll keep tabs on developments on emerging market currencies from the African side. For you, uh, let's move on to Kenya now. It will be cross-listing its two billion dollar euro bond at the Nairobi Securities Exchange to allow Kenyan citizens to actually trade it. Now, that is, of course, according to the Kenyan Deputy President William Samoy Ruto. He made those comments at an investment conference earlier on Monday. Kenya's debut euro bond did make its uh, debut at the Irish Stock Exchange in June. It's been traded over there ever since. It drew bids of 8.8 .8 billion US dollars. American investors bought about two thirds of what was on offer. British investors took about a quarter. Quick run through the equities here for you. Very different day from what we're used to seeing, especially given the bloodbath we've seen in West Africa over the last couple of years, uh, sorry, couple of weeks. Uh, the NEC All Share Index in Nigeria down by just under two tenths. The NEC 20 in Kenya by, down by about a percentage point or so. The EGX, however, profit taking essentially led to that tanking. You're seeing an advanced decline ratio of 145 to 22 over there. In Nigeria, however, remember, Orlando does have a cash call. It's looking to raise about $300 million through a rights issue that closes on the 19th of December. Coming up next, Zimbabwe is turning to solar energy to light up more and more of its homes. And if you happen to have a pet in South Africa, insurers are looking for you. I'll tell you why next. This is the first year that Africa will have more foreign direct investment than aid. And it's like the tipping point in terms of changing the way the continent is perceived. And I think this summit very much responds to that call. Now, whether it can materialize what is being announced is something that we'll have to check uh, and see whether it happens. Welcome back. Let's head over to Zimbabwe. Over six million individuals in that country are completely disconnected from the grid altogether. 83% of rural households in that country rely on biomass as their primary fuel for energy use, especially for cooking. Zimbabwe's government, however, wants to change that, and it's turning to solar energy to plug the gap. Wazir Hamsin has more. 
Many communities in Zimbabwe do not have access to power. This has prompted the government to explore alternative sources of energy such as solar and biogas in order to tackle the problem. Solar is the future, uh, not because Zesta these days is giving us challenges, but we need that even, even as a way of conserving the energy that we, we have, this new technology. One thing I would have wanted as well, every new building in Zimbabwe, whether it's in urban areas or in rural areas, my view is we should insist that it has a solar energy system as well. Adoption of solar energy, which is indeed the cheapest source of energy, will improve the lives of communities throughout the country. However, the main obstacle preventing large-scale implementation of solar-powered energy generation is the inefficiency of current solar technology and the cost as the systems require a large upfront investment. Most people cannot afford a basic solar panel. We believe that uh, people in the rural setting can virtually be uplifted and have better standards of living. For example, long hours of study of school children because they have access to, to light in the evening. The, the women can also be facilitated in doing their garden projects and also in the home, working in a lightened environment. We believe our schools and clinics can benefit uh, the communities in which they have been built because they've got access to light, which is harvested from the sun which is around us in the village. The Zimbabwe Energy Regulatory Authority has already received an application from Yellow Africa Private Limited to construct a 100 megawatts solar power plant to help in generating electricity across the country. Hopefully, this will help reduce power outages and improve doing business in the country. Wazir Khamsin, CCTV. Over in South Africa, the pet insurance industry is slowly but surely gathering quite a bit of momentum. Pooch lovers and feline friends have increasingly been hit by high bills, especially when it comes to taking care of their pets in emergency cases. And it's still considered to have a luxury, as far as private health is concerned, for your pet, given the fact that many a South African don't have access to proper health insurance, much less medical care. But for those who can afford it, it's increasingly becoming a necessity. Travis Andrews has more. Dog has always been man's best friend, but it's a friendship that at the worst of times can become quite costly. Private veterinary healthcare can ring up quite a bill, and many are now looking at pet cover to avoid these sometimes exorbitant costs. Pet insurers are registering exponential growth, as owners are increasingly taking out cover against those unexpected days when the animals are in need of an emergency trip to the vet. South Africans have the big pet owners and um, it's just basically getting people out there to know about it in order for them to protect their wallets and their pets so that they can afford to look after their pets in the way that they should. We're getting a growth rate of around 350 new pets a month signing up and it's on a national basis, not just located like around one area. So it's definitely out there, it's definitely growing. Some plans start at around $20 a month for dogs. And that includes any unforeseen accidents and illnesses that require medicine or hospitalization. The advancements in veterinary medicine may play a part in why some bills are so high, as well as the specialized health care that gets given to the animals. A dog or cat can't tell you what is wrong with them. They will show you signs and symptoms, but you need to do diagnostic tests to figure out exactly what you're dealing with and what the problem is. So that all adds up. It's an issue that many people face on a daily basis, whether or not to insure an animal, which many see as part of the family. In many cases, a veterinary bill can dwarf that of a person going to see a private medical doctor. So it's not surprising to see more and more pet owners trying to avoid these high costs by taking out pet cover. You can't take on a dog and then not um, be in a position to uh, care for it when it gets sick. So if, if um, in order to have a dog and care for it, you need to take out pet insurance, then that's what you must do. I mean, in South Africa, everything to do with uh, human medicine or, or, or hospital, you know, it's, it's all paid for, it's all expensive. So 
you know, you, you've got to weigh up the cost of, of, of the treatment for yourself, for your pets, and the cost of medical cover and pet insurance. I'm extremely happy I took pet insurance because my full breed dog has a lot of problems from the start, a lot of it to do with breeding. And for that reason, she's been to the vet a lot. Vet costs are very high, and I've saved 80% of what I spent, which is a lot. But the pet insurance market is still relatively growing and to a large degree seen as a luxury by many who still seem to grapple with its affordability. But for those who have it, they find it a great degree of financial security for them and their beloved pets. That was Andrew, CCTV, Cape Town. Away from pets, let's look at oil. Guess who's back above $80 a barrel? Brent crude. It essentially has been hovering around that level for today, around speculation about a possible cut to output by OPEC in its November 27th meeting. We'll have the details on that when it happens right here on CCTV. Coming up next, we'll introduce you to a group of, entrepreneur, of enterprising businessmen who are beating the odds in Goma to actually create a cheese empire. Asia. Asia means business. Now then, businesses, thriving enterprises, not the words you associate ordinarily with the DRC. But despite the years of conflict that has rocked that country, some tenacious cheesemakers in Goma are now looking to expand their business into neighboring countries. In Grassroots tonight, you find out what makes the cheese from Goma so special. This tranquility is at odds with the violence witnessed in this area in recent years. The town of Goma, in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, has been at the center of a refugee crisis and three decades of war. But in a hillside village outside town, cows graze peacefully. With its cool climate and abundant cattle, the area offers the ideal conditions for dairy production, more so cheese production. Belgian priests first started making cheese here in the 1970s. Locals continued ever since. There are hundreds of small dairy farms in the area, each one producing cheese using no more than a bathtub, fishnets, buckets and some metal pots. The first step is to put the milk in the tank. The second is to add the chemicals. The third step is the cutting. And then comes the mixing, then the placing of those small balls of milk into molds. Simply known as Goma cheese, it's like a milder version of Dutch Gouda, softer in texture, and is considered a delicacy with the local population. Much of the cheese found in Africa is imported from Europe, the production of one cheese blocks requires up to 10 liters of milk. Luckily, there are enough cows to sustain regular production. What these farmers struggle with is to significantly increase their output. We have the cows, so there is no problem there. What we lack is the modern materials for production and the market to sell our products. We do not export to Rwanda. 
the country does not accept cheese from here into its territory. We do not know why. <laughs> Neighboring countries Rwanda and Uganda prohibited the import of Goma cheese. Both countries say it's to protect local cheese industries. Despite this challenge, cheesemakers in Goma will continue to do what they've been doing for decades. Valdi Karolsa, CCTV. As far as currencies are concerned, we're keeping a very close eye on the Naira. It did recover a little bit from that uh, 178 level that it hit in trading earlier today. Went back up to about 177 later trading. The MPC's decision will be out on Tuesday. And you'll have the details and the analysis for that in a lot more detail right here for you tomorrow. That said, uh, here's what we're working on for tomorrow's programme. Nigeria, on the fiscal side, we'll be looking at the government's proposal to cut fuel subsidies. A similar proposal led to countrywide protests in 2012. Will that happen yet again next year? We'll find out. We'll also be looking at South Africa's progress in its plan to industrialise even more, given an announcement by its Department of Trade and Industry to that end. But that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. Thank you so much for watching. Do remember, you can send your feedback to this programme at globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. And of course, when you're offline, you can always check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Our content goes up over there 24-7. We'll see you in 23 hours. I'm Brahman Yan.